All right, so today I want to show you some of the more challenging projects breeding ball pythons. I'm actually into some of these projects myself, and let me tell you, some of the challenges, they absolutely drive me crazy. Some of these I haven't actually gotten into just because of the challenges, and then some of these projects, I'd say the ball python industry is all but given up. There's only a select few people that have still decided to get into these projects, and all of them produce some really amazing combinations. Now let me tell you, if you're breeding ball pythons, you definitely have to know your genes and what you're getting into when you start breeding ball pythons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to the internet and I want to show you each individual project and the challenges associated with each of those projects when breeding ball pythons. All right, so I'm gonna jump over here on morphmarket.com and I wanna start with probably one of the more challenging projects that I've ever dealt with, and that is the male makers and the female makers. And it's really associated with two genes, the bananas and the coral glows, and it's only associated typically with the males. So a male can be a male maker or a female maker, and then the females will actually produce half males and half females, which is kind of interesting too. As a matter of fact, I actually went to some of the early presentations at some of the reptile shows, and people would actually get up in front of, you know, a whole audience of people, and they'd use a whiteboard trying to explain the male maker and the female maker phenomena. And I'd say it's, it's kind of pros and cons both ways. So for example, if you actually have a banana, like this one right here, take a look at this one. This is what, just just a straight banana looks like. This is a male and it's a male maker, which is really powerful in order to add other genes into your banana. So for example, you could actually take this one, breed it to like a pinstripe, and then if you produce a pinstripe banana, that one would be a male because all the banana offspring the, from this one will actually be all males. You get no female bananas which is pretty powerful for adding other genes into your bananas or your core glows. So you can actually, for example, you can actually take this, breed it to a pinstripe, produce a banana pinstripe, and then produce a male from that one. And then the males mature a lot faster than the females. So you could take your male after usually like a year, year and a half, you could take your banana pinstripe and breed it into something like a pastel. And then you'd actually have a banana pinstripe pastel. And then a year and a half later, you could actually take that and breed other genes into it and keep adding more and more genes really quick and really build a lot of genes into your banana. But the problem is, is uh, if you kind of wrap your head around kind of the traditional setup that I, I say I would recommend most people do, and most people actually do this, what they'll do is they'll get like really low end females, like normals or single gene females, and then they'll get like a powerhouse male that has all the genes. And that way you can actually take your male with all the genes and breed it to multiple females. Uh, usually you can breed, I'd say like three to four females per one male. I've actually seen people breed over 10 females <laughs> with one male, but I wouldn't really recommend it. I'd say most people kind of stop at four. But what you're really doing is you're taking a whole bunch of genes in your powerhouse male and you're spreading it around to all your females to really increase the diversity of all your offspring, uh, kind of on the, the best bang for your buck as far as the setup. The problem is, is if you have all these powerhouse males and then you jump into a project like the banana and you have all male makers. The problem is, is you can't get all those genes from your powerhouse males into your banana because all your bananas are males. And I've kind of run into that here in my collection. I actually have bamboo. I want to get, I want to make a bamboo banana. But the problem is, is all my bamboos so far have all been males. I haven't had any females. Uh, I have a couple that I'm breeding for the first time this year, some female bamboos. But that's kind of the problem that you face with the male makers and the female makers. And then kind of on the flip side, if you actually have a female maker and produce all female bananas, there's a really good market for your female bananas but but kind of on the flip side is say for example if you take a, a, um, a female maker banana you breed it to something else 
all the banana offspring are females, but all your non-banana offspring are males. So you'll get kind of this division between your males and your females based on if the banana is in there or not. So it really depends. <laughs> it's, it, you you kind of go down this rabbit hole of the males and the females, and you kind of just, you know, you wish you could actually just breed it and have a mix of males and females with a banana in there, and it doesn't really work that way. But the, on the other flip side, you can actually take a female banana, breed something to that, and then the female banana will actually produce half males and half female bananas. But then again, all the males will be female makers. And it gets really confusing trying to wrap your head around the males and female makers. And a lot of people stand up with a whiteboard, you know, try to draw, draw it all out. And it, a lot of people will still get confused with the male makers and the female makers. But let me tell you, you can make some of the most amazing combinations with bananas and the core glows, and that's one of the reasons I stick with it. I'd say, if you're getting into the project, probably what I would do is I would get male makers and female makers in your collection, and that way you'd have the diversity as far as making the males and the females and breeding anything to the offspring. All right, so let's move on to number two. So this is multiple recessives. I actually got into this project when I bred an albino pie to a clown and I produced some triple heads. This is, let me tell you, this is definitely a long game. If you're into really super long games into some of the multiple recessives. And I actually came over here to the World of Ball Pythons, the genetic wizard, and you can actually plug in your genes over here. So I actually plugged in the genes of my offspring that I'm raising up. I actually have het albino, het clown, and het pides that I'm breeding together. And if you look at all the offspring, look at all the, all the different combinations that I can get from those two snakes. And you come all the way down here on the bottom, you can actually get the triple visual recessive, which is the albino clown pied visual. But look at the odds, one in 64 chance that you'll actually hit the, the triple visual. And the problem is, is I'd say in most, like I'd say with a young ball python, usually you start out producing maybe about six eggs per clutch. Then as the age of mature, you get a little more. But the problem is, is even with six eggs per clutch, you're looking at 10 years before you get a triple visual. And that's just breeding two snakes together. So what I've actually done, I've come down this path, I've actually produced four females. So you're actually cutting it down significantly from 10 years, <laughs> you're cutting that by 25%. So you know, you know, technically in two and a half to three years, I could produce my triple visual. And then what you can actually do is if you produce the triple visual, you can actually breed it to another recessive. So take a look at this. You could do something like this. <laughs> I actually plugged in four, uh, this is like a quadruple het. Het albino, het clown, het desert ghost, and het pied. And if you bred those two together, take a look at the odds and all the different combinations that you get from all these offspring <laughs> it's just it's just a disney you're kind of going down the rabbit hole with all these and you'd have a one in 256 chance of getting an albino clown desert ghost pied which is absolutely crazy so for example if you actually took uh, like the calculator, 256, and you divided it by six eggs per clutch, you're looking at 43 years. <laughs> if you just had two snakes and you bred them together, it would take you 43 years, pretty much a lifetime to produce the quadruple visual, which is kind of crazy. So for me, uh, you know, if you actually, if, if, if I actually went down this road, what I would actually do is I would produce multiple females. So if you produced four females, potentially you could cut this down to 10 years if you hit the odds. And that's another thing. Sometimes the odds can kind of play tricks on you. You can breed this for a hundred years and sometimes you wouldn't hit it, which is kind of crazy too. So let me tell you, if you're going down the multiple recessives, you have to have a lot of patience and plan for a lot of time 
to actually get these. And that's why if you actually see a lot of these coming out right from the beginning, a lot of times like the uh, like the double recessives, when they first came out, they were incredibly expensive because they took so long to produce. And then the triple recessives. And then once you produce them, you know, if you actually breed like a triple visual to a triple visual, you can produce like a whole clutch of triple visuals. So the further you go down this road, the more you can produce, which drops the price significantly. But yeah, that's kind of a long-term project you kind of want to put on the back burner. That is a really challenging project. All right, so number three, let's talk about uh, visually dominant genes, such as the champagne or the banana or the monsoon or the sunset. So all those genes are really visually dominant, meaning if you actually work other genes in with those genes, the, these genes are really visually dominant where sometimes it'll completely dominate the color or the pattern of the other genes. So for example, the champagne, a lot of times when you breathe other genes into the champagne, essentially what'll happen is the champagne is really visually dominant as far as the pattern. And a lot of times it'll completely wipe out the pattern of a lot of the other genes. So you can add a lot of yellow and orange genes and essentially what you'll end up with is like almost a patternless snake with the champagne. It'll be, sometimes it'll be like bright yellow or bright orange. So sometimes you have to really pick what you're breeding with these visually dominant genes. So for example, uh, like the banana is, the banana is really visually dominant as far as the color, but a lot of times it'll let the pattern come through. So with your bananas, you can do a lot of stuff like, uh, like leopard or enchi or spot nose and breed a lot of stuff into your banana to really uh, mix up the pattern and let the color shine through from the banana. With the champagne, it's kind of completely opposite. It'll let a lot of the color through from the other genes, but a lot of times it'll completely eliminate most of the pattern from the other genes. So instead of picking genes like uh, like the pattern enhancing genes, you want to kind of uh, kind of focus on the the bright color genes in your champagne. And then sometimes there's an, an kind of a weird anomaly, <laughs> like with some of these visually dominant genes that are that are kind of challenging. I actually brought this one up right here. Take a look at this. This is actually a champagne combination. This is called the gray matter. It's almost like a, almost like a silver metallic pied. It looks like a pied, but it doesn't have the pied gene in it. And essentially what this is, this is the, the super cinnamon champagne, which is kind of crazy. Probably one of the best champagne combinations. Let me tell you, if I was actually working with the champagne, I would definitely go down the road of the gray manners. And these are, wow, these are, they used to be really expensive. I can't believe this one sold for $1,200. The, they used to be thousands and thousands of dollars for these gray manners. All right, here's another challenging project. Let's talk about the panda pied. Look at this snake. This is one of the most breathtaking combinations that I have ever seen. Essentially what it is, it's a pied where the black is almost like an inkjet black on the panda pied. It almost looks like someone took some ink and has really defined differences between the white and the black. Makes for a really stunning combination. So if you actually look at the genes in the panda pied, this is the super black pastel and the pied. So one of the one of the problems with the super black pastel is it kind of tends towards genetic defects. Uh, one of the one of the minor genetic defects with the super black pastel, I'd say a lot of times it'll give you kind of a uh, almost like a pug nose or a misshaped head where it'll kind of push in the nose. And on this one, it's, it's, it has a perfect face on this one, which is pretty amazing. I'm actually surprised. This is one of the best panda pides I've seen. And then the other thing about the, the super black pastel is a lot of times it's, it's kind of known for occasional kinking of the spine. So sometimes you get a genetic defect where the spine's not completely straight and you'll have a slight kink in the spine. Although I'd say overall the, the kinking in the spine doesn't really seem like it's very common. 
I'd say a misshapen head with, with the super black pastel is a little bit more common. Although a lot of people kind of like the kind of the pug nose, <laughs> kind of the pug nose look of the the head on the super black pastels. So a lot of people, what they try to do is they try to go around and try to use different jeans other than the super black pastel in with a pied to kind of get the same effect. But I haven't really seen anything that is is just as good as, as super black like inkjet black like the super black pastel some people have tried the suma which is the super mahogany which is almost like a goldish black color i've actually seen people try to put other jeans in with the suma like uh, just one copy of the black pastel which is pretty close not quite as dark as the super black pastel the other kind of interesting thing about this combination is if you come over here on morph market and look at all the different panda pies what you'll actually see is most of them are really high white and most of them will have just a little bit of black like right on the tail some of them are actually completely white this is the one that I've seen with the most black on a panda pied. So what I would actually do if I, if I was going down this project, I would do, I would, I would still do the super black pastel, but I would do Enchi in with the combination. So if you actually add Enchi in with a pied, a lot of times it'll bring in a lot more color up on the pied. And since this is a really high white combination in a lot of cases, I would think the Enchi would be, it kind of bring it back to where it's about 50-50 in a lot of cases. Uh, it could go completely <laughs> the opposite way where you have a really super low white pied, panda pied, which would be uh, not what you're really looking for. If you're looking for like the 50-50, maybe the Enchi would actually work. All right, so let's move on to the next one. This is the Desert Jean. Not many people work on this. This is extremely challenging. And the problem with the Desert Jean, not to be confused with the Desert Ghost, uh, which is perfectly fine, but the desert gene has a problem with infertility with the females. So if you actually come over here to morphmarket.com and search for snakes for sale with the desert gene, there's only five of them, <laughs> which is crazy. Out of the hundreds of thousands of snakes over here at Morph Market, just, I, I think just a couple people are working with the desert gene. And you can actually get some really stunning combinations like this one. This is actually a desert inchy pastel spider and take a look at this one this is actually a female and look at the price on this one 250 bucks it's it's really super cheap and if you look at this description on this one it says this girl is a beauty but is pet only because she carries the desert gene and cannot be bred so I've actually heard if you take a female desert and try to breed it, uh, either it'll lay infertile eggs or sometimes the, the females can get egg bound and die from trying to breed them. So if you're actually working with the desert gene, most people will only breed a male. They'll breed it to something else and then all the females will pretty much mark as pet only. But I remember I was actually looking at a YouTube video where some guy was breeding desert through his entire collection and every single snake that he pulled out was absolutely stunning. And if you're wondering what the desert looks like, I would say it looks almost exactly the same as Desert Ghost. Uh, I, I did a video where I compared the desert side by side with Desert Ghost and visually they look almost exactly the same, but the desert is a dominant gene and the Desert Ghost is recessive. So you can, you can produce a lot more deserts really super quick by breeding a male through your collection versus trying to work with a recessive and then you get hats and then have to breed back the hats. But, but yeah, that's kind of a bummer with the whole desert. The desert Desert dilemma. That's one of the more challenging. It's it's almost to the point where people don't even work with desert anymore, which is kind of crazy. All right, let's talk about another challenge. That is quickly dropping prices. Prices that plummet super fast. And the, the thing that I can think of that where prices drop the fastest that I've ever seen is the scaleless head. So take a look at this. This was back in 2015. When I first started in ball pythons, it was 2015. Now I remember these scaleless heads coming out and they're selling for, you take a look at the price on this one, $45,000, which is kind of crazy. And the scaleless heads, they just have a few scales missing on the top of their head. And if you breed two scaleless heads together, 25 
percent of the time you'll get a completely scaleless ball python so it was really a groundbreaking gene with what you know nobody thought there was any genetic defects or anything no problems with the scaleless so everybody's you know everybody just jumped into the scaleless and that's the problem is everyone started producing them and flooded the market with an incredible number of scaleless heads i remember going to the narbc and every single table almost all the snakes on the whole table were all scaleless heads and the price plummeted super fast so take a look at this this was $45,000 in 2015 and take a look at this five years later just five years look at the price on this one $150 that is amazing and it was kind of interesting with the the whole scaleless head and the scaleless it seemed like everybody jumped in all at once and just kind of flooded the market with the scaleless heads and the scaleless and then the price dropped so fast and so far that people are like you know for 150 bucks you know it's not even hardly worth you know me breeding this that's a little bit more than like a normal i could produce you know pastel or something like that for 150 bucks and then it seems like everybody got out of the scaleless and the scaleless head uh, back in 2020 and then now over the last two years it seems like the prices for the scaleless and the scaleless heads have really kind of shot up quite a bit which is kind of interesting if you actually look at the ball python market it's really based on supply and demand so the more supply there is the lower the price goes and it seems like if the price goes to a, below a certain threshold a lot of people kind of dump the project and get into something else and then it kind of rebounds after that which is kind of an interesting effect all right, so the last one I want to show you is the yellow belly complex, specifically the freeways. So the freeways, the highways, uh, the pumas, the super stripes, they're all yellow belly complexes. And that's the combination of one of the genes in the yellow belly complex along with yellow belly. And you end up with a snake like this. This is absolutely stunning. I'd say that's probably some of the most beautiful snakes in all of ball pythons, the freeways and the highways. And the problem is, is if you actually took a snake like this and bred it to a normal ball python, you'd get what look like almost all normal ball pythons. You get yellow bellies and you get asphalts. And the yellow bellies and the asphalts look almost like a normal, unless you have a trained eye where you can kind of pick out the markers to tell if it's a yellow belly or an asphalt. And then the other problem is, is you can't tell the difference between the yellow belly and the asphalt. They look virtually identical. So that's one of the projects. It's almost like uh, you can tell if it's, if it's one of the genes in the yellow belly complex if you look at the markers, but you can't tell which gene it is. So if, you, if someone handed you a snake, you can kind of pick out the markers and you'd say, yes, this is a yellow belly or a gravel or an asphalt or a spark or a specter, all those genes in the yellow belly complex, but you couldn't tell which one it was until you bred it to something else that contained another gene in the yellow belly complex. So it's one of the more challenging projects. Uh, I was actually thinking about getting into this project at one point, but the, the confusion between between not really knowing which gene was which in all my hatchlings kind of turned me off to it. But kind of on the flip side, I've heard that they are doing some genetic testing with the sheds of ball pythons which they're actually working on the differences between the genes in the yellow belly complex. And if they could actually nail that down, it would be an interesting project to go into. Of course, in this case, uh, as a matter of fact, someone was asking me, you know, the genetic testing, do you think it'll increase the prices or decrease the prices? In the case of hats, uh, I would think it would increase the price of your hatchlings because you can tell the difference between like a 50% hat. You, you, if you did the genetic testing, you'd know 100% sure that it was head for that gene. But in this case, I think it might artificially decrease the prices for the highways and the freeways because the project would suddenly become a lot easier and people could make highways and freeways a lot better and they know the the yellow bellies from the asphalt so and I think that's one of the reasons that the prices kind of stay high with the freeways and the highways is because of the challenges around the project and you just can't mass produce 
uh, like the highways and the freeways like you can with a lot of other combinations. So I don't know, it's kind of a double-edged sword with the DNA testing, but let me tell you, you can produce some really amazing combinations. I want to show you one last picture here. I just randomly found this. I've never seen this over here. Take a look at this. This is a freeway combination. This is a banana enchi orange dream freeway. Take a look at that crazy snake. And you actually have banana on top of it. So that's another challenging gene, the banana. And it's a female maker. So you're going down the female maker road with the banana. But that is pretty stunning. And I've actually seen some of the most amazing snakes with the, with the freeways and the highways. It's, it's pretty amazing. And as a matter of fact, I've seen some people working with uh, Super Stripes too, making some really good progress, making some really amazing combinations with that. All right, so that's pretty much it. I <laughs> hope you learned something. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.